Welcome uh, everybody. Uh, today we are happy to have you uh, with us in our workshop uh, introduction to Docker for air users. So uh, I'm very happy to have with, uh, with me Rami Crispin. Uh, Rami is a data scientist. Uh, he did a lot of work on time series analysis and forecasting application. Uh, he is the author of uh, hands-on time series analysis with R uh, and other several uh, R packages, including the TS Studio packages for time series analysis and forecasting applications. Also, uh, Rami did a great work uh, for tackling the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, Corona, uh, he had, he has, uh, a dashboard for for tracking coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 Italy, COVID-19 Swiss, etc. So welcome Rami with us. Um, I think we will have a short presentation of our ladies Tunis. Uh, then uh, we will uh, start uh, the workshop. So, Heja, if you yeah, so Heja, can, uh, can you screen? please share your screen? Heja, do you hear us? Uh, yeah, I think. Yes, yes, I will share ah, my screen. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> So uh, we will share with you the presentation of Our Lady's Tunis. Uh, it's done uh, with the R. Hello and welcome to this workshop session. Before starting in the workshop, we'll introduce you to the Our Lady's Global and Our Lady's Tunis initiative. The R community suffers from an underrepresentation of minority Vendors in every role and area of participation, whether as leaders, package developers, conference speakers, conference participants, educators, or users. As a diversity initiative, the mission of Our Ladies is to achieve proportionate representation by encouraging, inspiring, and empowering people of genders currently underrepresented in the R community and to facilitate individual and collective progress worldwide. Gabriella De Caros founded Our Ladies on October 1, 2012. Our Ladies Global was born and the grant was awarded in September 2016. Since then, Our Ladies has grown to 170 chapters in 44 countries and 39,000 members. Our Ladies Tunis is part of Our Ladies Initiative and was created in May 2020 by women working as data scientists and biostatisticians and bioinformaticians. Our goal is to create an R our community in Tunis and empower underrepresented genders in the R community. This is the core team of Our Ladies Tunis. Come and join our community on social media. This presentation was made with R Markdown. Thank you for watching this video and enjoy our workshop. So, thank you everyone for watching the presentation. And now let's um, move to the workshop. So, Rami, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Haifa. Uh, first, I want, I'm really excited to be here, and I want to thank uh, Mona Haifa and all the Our Lady organization for uh, having this workshop. I think when we had this first conversation about doing a workshop, we actually, I think we started about talking about Flex dashboard, deploying Flex dashboard and uh, doing cool stuff with this. But then when we started to talk about it, like uh, the prerequisite to deploying um, on the web Flex dashboard or anything similar is Docker. And then we kind of like got into this topic. Uh, so uh, I assume that most of people here never used Docker, so I'm aiming to have it really introductory. And like after the workshop, 
you probably won't be expert in building Docker, but I think it will give you a sense why you should start using Docker and what are the advantages of using it. Uh, and maybe you will continue to go and deep in your um, understanding about how Docker works and what you can do with it. So let me sh start with sharing my screen. So the first thing that I, I created, and I'm sorry that I'm sometimes we look up because I have another monitor, so it might be a bit awkward. Uh, so I created um, a GitHub repository. I will share it in a second, or maybe I, we can do it now on the chat. Uh, how do I access the chat? I will, I will try to do it in a second, but uh, all the materials that we'll cover here are available on this. Uh, here, I got it. Chat. I will put that in the chat now. No worries. Uh, so all the materials that we we'll cover today is over here. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to start with um, uh, some background of um, like what Docker does, what are the advantages, like more theory. And then we will move to art coding, to build Dockers, to see how the architect of Docker is working. So with that, let's just jump to um, slides that I just created. And, and just before I, I, will, I will give you a heads up that uh, we plan to do it early in, in October. And then I told uh, one and a half when we spoke that uh, I'm expecting, my wife expecting is a nine month pregnant and we expected the baby earlier, but it still <laughs> didn't come yet. So, so the only thing that could stop this workshop if the daddy, baby decide to come now <laughs> during the workshop and definitely I'm going to call him Docker if he'll come during this workshop. But, but uh, I hope we will wait for another two hours until nature will decide to do his work. The other uh, technical other technical issue that I have now, I'm in Calif I'm based in California and we had those wildfire recently and it's in, it damaged some of the infrastructure of the internet uh, provider. So it might, uh, sometimes it, the internet is just dropping. In this case, I will it's just take a few minutes and it, I will return and, uh, or I will connect with my mobile. So if I'm disappearing out of the blue, it's just the internet here is really having our time during the recent days. So with that, let's kick it off. Um, so I think that uh, you already uh, uh, hyper provide the good introduction about what I'm doing. I'm data scientist, I'm really into our starts and time series. Um, I think that also it's like the, the, you know, the, the images on the right kind for representing what I'm doing. And, and I can also explain why, how I got it into Docker, besides like working day to day, putting uh, stuff on production. I think like the first experience that I realized that I need to have a Docker is when I wrote uh, my book. And uh, you know, you write and you give a code example, but then as time passing by and there are packages are getting updated, so some of your code may not work as expected or as the output on the book. Book and uh, this is the first point I realized that maybe I should dockerize uh, my book, setting the version that I'm using to make sure that anybody can reproduce the results that are in the book. And then the second part that like the really moved me into Docker when I started to work on the coronavirus package early in February, and the data get updated on a daily basis, and I started updating on a daily basis, going to trigger the code manually and I realized it doesn't really, it's not scalable and I had to build some automation. And then this is really uh, the point that I exposed to Docker in my personal uh, open source contribution. Um, so the agenda for today, we will start by um, giving some background to Docker, more, it's a like more comp 
computer science background, and it might be awkward because I'm not a computer science person, but I try to um, give you the motivation of why you need to use Docker and the architect from computer science perspective. And then we'll dive into the use case of Docker with R. We will go for a demo. I hope we will have time to go for all uh, the examples I prepared, but if not, uh, it will be available on GitHub. Uh, uh, I think maybe we may pause between each uh, session of the demo or during the slides to Q&A because I, I probably there might be a lot of questions in the middle. So if there is a need to stop um, on Haifa, please let me know if there are I can't see now the question, so, but if you want to post for a question, let me know. So uh, here are just a prerequisite by order of significance. So obviously uh, R is important. Then Docker, I would say it's like a language by itself, but it's a straightforward language that you run on the command line. So understanding how command line work is uh, essential to run Docker. I assume that most of you may not use it before, so I kind of like also made some um, bit of a background. It's very intuitive. Uh, it's not really, it's like really simple, so you shouldn't be worried about it. Uh, bash and shell scripting is really nice to know. It's not necessarily, but like if you want to do like advanced stuff, I recommend to use it uh, for automation. Yeah, it's also useful to know how YAML files working and already shared the um, workshop materials are on this link. I will also share uh, the slide. I will update it, uh, this repo with the slide that I'm now presenting. So we'll start with why you want to use Docker. And I think that I like this uh, image mainly because uh, you see the guy, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, uh, Woody uh, on the left. And the expression on his face is kind of like my expression when someone, as our user, someone like started to talk with me a few years ago about command line, Linux box, uh, and Docker. I was like, this is unknown and it's really scary. But I think over when I start to use it, uh, I move to be like the Version of uh, Buzz uh, Lightyear uh, that um, it's really useful. And in the future, you will see that, like as we move forward, it's not already it's, it's already in the present. Like everything is working in a container environment, and um, it's really powerful tool to know. So I think that if you're in the point that you are thinking about what is the next thing that you want to learn? If it's deep learning or something, machine learning fancy or anything, or Docker, go first for the Docker. It's much more valuable than learning another uh, modeling or stuff before it's going there. And if I need to summarize what Docker does in two words, I guess it is reproducibility and production. And if I need to extend it to three words, it's seamless reproducibility and production. It's it's really doing stuff smoothly. And I think that the next example might give you more sense of what Docker does. And it's kind of like remind me the days that I was RA, research assistant at the university. Uh, we were a lab working, a few uh, students working with a professor. And, and uh, we, assuming that we all using R and we all using the same code, we using some uh, Git or GitHub methodology that we all are in line in the same code. And we're using set seed, which kind of like we are setting the
So I think uh, Rami had the problem with his connection. Will you? You know, guys, it happens sometimes. Yes, I think uh, he lost the co the, the connection with. Uh... All right, Samari. Yeah, did I? I assume that my internet dropped. It's no, okay. it's okay. No worries. Yeah, so it not, happens. So I'm not sure which part you lost me. I was talking to myself. Um, so now I'm connecting with my mobile. So I hope it will. Scale. Yeah, if not, I will go back to the normal internet. But let's let's continue. I'm sorry, it might happen again. Uh, uh, we're just having our time with the internet. So I assume that I paused on the reproducibility example. So like I will repeat it, just assuming that you are working in a lab and it's not necessarily need to be a lab, you are working in a group um, and uh, you have uh, you're collaborating with uh, some code environment and you have a student, you're running the same code. Essentially, you're all using R, you're all uh, using it and you're, all, you're using SETSEED. Now, uh, all of you running the same code and each one getting a different value. And when your, your professor might get, get a role. And the reason could be many reasons, but Essentially, it starts with the R version that you're using. If each one using different version, you may get different results. And for example, if you know that there were major changes in version four and forward that were not uh, exist in version three. Like uh, if you're running data frame, the default option of data frame change. So that could cause some difference in the way that you are, uh, if four people running the same code with different version, uh, getting different output. Also, more important is the underlying version of the package that they're using. So if you're using different version of uh, Dplyr or TidyR, so you may pre-processing your data differently, at least the output, although you're running the same code. And last but not least is also the OS system that you're using. Uh, so you may have some using Mac, some using Windows, and some using Linux box. And uh, I love to work with C++ or Formfront. And there are different flavors. So if you are running uh, C++, it, it's also depending on the compiler. And you may have different compiler, different version. It could trigger a different result. And this is what Docker is essentially solving. So if you are, in this case, all of you running Docker on your machine and running the code and same code in the same image, um, you're essentially solving this issue. Uh, so you are running Docker with R version 3.62 with the same package versions and you all get to the same point. The second issue that uh, really emphasizes why you need to use Docker is the production problem. And this is like just, you know, Googling uh, people that using Shiny. And it's mainly when it's coming into a place when you like, really in the scale when you're using Shiny. So you're working on your own environment, you're developing, and then you're pushing it to your, or some production environment like AWS or any cloud environment. And then you get some error. Like if you see at the left side, uh, the upper side, like the screenshot of the Shiny that you had DT uh, table on, like running really well on your machine, but then we deploy it, uh, it fell. And, and the reason is that you develop and deploy on a different environment. You, you may missing some of the package or the version is different, and then it fell. 
Uh, if you are using Docker, your production environment and your reproducibility will be in a different place, much more smoother um, and easy to use. So here are some use cases of Docker with R. And so like the first, like one of the main is when you're doing CI CD, continue integration, continue development. So if you are building some modeling, you have a project that you are you know, pooling data, uh, cleaning the data, running uh, some modeling, and then shooting some shiny dashboard. This is like the best example of use, usage of Docker. Um, another example, if you're deploying some flex dashboard, is that something we talked about doing as a workshop, uh, deploying flex dashboard on a GitHub page, and you want to refresh it every day. Like if you're having some COVID-19 data that you want to show in a flex dashboard. Data automation, if you're developing packages, uh, modeling, and anything that requires reproducibility. So I can just give you a quick examples. This is a dashboard that I built recently, and it was deployed uh, with Docker on GitHub Action. And this is dashboard that tracking the wildfire uh, that is still running in the US. It's a bit slow because my internet is slow. But essentially um, what it does, you have here this GitHub action that is a tool for automation that calling a Docker image that set the environment and then run some R code. So essentially uh, this is the image and then uh, you run some bash code that triggers some R code and you get this dashboard uh, with the fire locations and metadata and it's keep updating every four hours. Um, another example is the dashboard tracking COVID-19 in Italy and working the same logic. There is some uh, data source uh, that you want to refresh. So you, wa you want to run some automation. In this case, I'm using, again, GitHub Action, but it can be any anything else. It could be AWS, Google Cloud, or any uh, cloud infrastructures. And these dashboards get refreshed by itself uh, every few hours, keeping the data up to date uh, to the most recent one. So before we will jump to the use case of, of Docker with us, so let's just go over from computer science um, perspective, what is Docker? So this is um, a platform for OS level virtualization, meaning that you are triggering some OS um, virtual uh, system that runs something. It's not, it's similar to virtual environment, but it's not. There is some distinguish between the two, which I'm not going to enter because I'm not really a uh, computer science person, but it's much more efficient. And the idea is that you can create multiple containers and isolate them. So if one is failing, the rest will still continue to work. And when you have a failure, you just, you know, rebuild the container and, and put it back. It's easy to or, or to, like to run a large app that have multiple containers because it's easy to isolate problem. Um, and uh, the idea that you can uh, use different components of software and app. And I think the most important, it enables seamless shipment. So usually like you have the developers and you have the devs up. And in the past, the developers send the code to the dev op uh, team with some instruction how to deploy it. And then it always fail because you are missing some components. The version is not right. Uh, Docker is just, you're sending your code with the environment. So nothing really needs to be done after that. You are already sending it with as it is. Last but not least, it's open source. The Docker engine is open source. You have a free version and enterprise version with support. Like if you, 
uh, want to host the Docker and images with support, so then you need to have the enterprise version. So um, to get the sense, like how does it work? So if you have some infrastructure like uh, AWS or Google Cloud, and on top of it, you have some operating system such as Linux, uh, you're putting your Docker engine and then you start to host cut, like to manage those uh, containers deploying different apps. And the idea is, uh, for example, you realize that AppC has some issue, some bug. You don't need to stop the whole process. You can just uh, remove AppC uh, or if there is some failure and redeploy the container after you fix it. And I guess the best way to describe what it does, like in terms of our world, imagine that you are uh, in the academic world and you're writing a document or you're writing a paper and you send it to review. And usually with the process when you're sending a document to review, you need to send your data and your code, but you don't send the environment. So it could be that they still get a different results and then you need to sort it and figure out why uh, the data that you are using uh, or the output that you, you are sending uh, is different from the one that the uh, person that's checking your uh, article. And the idea here is that you, in, with Docker, you're simply uh, sending your, uh, any work that you're doing, if it's a, uh, a paper or a software with the environment itself. So think about like you're taking a Linux box, you're putting your code and you're sending the same environment that you ran the code to the other people that you're sharing with. So before we will go to more details about Docker with R, um, so to install Docker, you need uh, on, um, on Linux, it can run natively because it's based on Linux. But if you're using Mac or Windows, you need the, the Docker desktop, which is kind of like virtual Linux that's running on top of Mac and Windows that enable you to run it like in Linux. Uh, and let's just go quickly to this. Let's see if I can open it. If people want to go and install it, they will have sense of. So for me, you can download. Um, I have Mac, so I'm using the Docker desktop. If you're using Windows, you can uh, use similarly the same way uh, Docker in uh, Windows. And if you're using Linux or any flavor of Linux, uh, you can just uh, use it directly. And over here, you can see I have the Docker dashboard, which we can go over it uh, once we start to work uh, with the Docker on, on the demo. But this is essentially enable you to run the images uh, itself. So Docker with R. So I think now it's kind of like we can go to down to earth, like uh, moving from the computer science and focus what are we doing with R. Uh, so let's start talk about a workflow. And this is something I'm using as a workflow. I don't say that this is the way that you should use, but it's kind of like example of a workflow. So typically uh, you start to code on your machine with some uh, working development. Uh, you have some R installed, you have some packages. And once uh, it starts to get to some maturity, you understand what are the dependency, like what packages are you using uh, and what are the other dependency. You're building a Docker image that contain all the, um, dependency that you use on your development. And then uh, once you build the Docker image, the next step is to uh, create a testing environment, which essentially is just taking the container and, and put it in another container with our studio. So now you can run the code inside our studio environment, but you're in a Docker. And anything that run in this environment will work on the deployment, assuming that you deploy it in, in, with Docker. And the last step is once you, you kind of like 
make sure that your build of your base Docker is done properly, that everything is working. You finish the testing and you send it to um, the, your deployment, like some cloud environment or GitHub action or any automation tool. A more uh, robust way to do it is with um, with like a one step that you are already starting when your product is much more mature with a Docker environment with R Studio, and you start your development uh, already with inside the Docker that you're mounting your hardware your machine to the Docker. So anything that you are changing in your Docker will also write back Can you hear me? Uh, it's okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, yeah, my internet keeps dropping here. Um, so I'm not sure where did you <laughs> lost me, uh, but I will stay on my mobile uh, internet and hope it won't. It will be enough to continue. So let's talk about how you build a Docker in R. So anything that you start in uh, Docker, you are starting with some image. You need to pull some image and the lower level is the OS system. So let's say that you are starting with Ubuntu. Ubuntu is, is a, a Linux flavor OS system, which is running on top of uh, on Linux. And then you start to install anything, everything from scratch. So you need to think about it. You're buying a new, Linux box out of like empty, nothing was installed and you need to install anything from scratch. Assuming that you're starting from scratch to build your Docker. So before you can install R, you need to install the compiler that required to run R. So you need to have like some compiler for C and C++ and Fortran and so on. And then you can install, let's say R version four and you create a Docker that it's only functionality that it has uh, R version four. And you can tag it, let's say we tag it base R4. Now um, you want to build another Docker uh, with packages. So you don't need to start from scratch. You can take the Docker that you build before, the image that you build before, and you know, start from uh, base R4 and you pull this uh, image and build the new image on top of it. So now you can, uh, you already are, you have R version four, you can install the tidyverse, um, you can install shiny, and now you have a new Docker image that has um, tidyverse and shiny. So we call it, we tag it as tidyverse four. Now, let's say that you want to add an additional functionality. So you can, um, now you want to have maybe to, on top of it, R Studio uh, on, to run inside the Docker. So you are starting with the Docker that you created, the second Docker that I developed for, and you install R Studio. And now you have a uh, working environment with R Studio, Tidyverse, R version 4, and so on. So this is one workflow to build Docker in steps. The other workflow is would just, you know, run everything in, in one image from scratch. And you're starting with, the, with uh, pulling the OS, which is in this case is the Ubuntu. You're adding the compiler, you're installing the R, you're installing the Tidyverse, uh, Shiny and 
our studio. Now you need to think about uh, each component as the layer. And the layer should be in some, in some cases should be in a conical order. So you cannot install, for example, R before you add the compiler because the installation will fail. Um, and you cannot install tidyverse before you installed R. So it should be some order. And, and it's important to understand what we're going to talk about it in, a, in a bit about why the, those layers are important. So let's say now that you want to update your Docker and you want to uh, upgrade the R version to uh, version four, let's say 402. So you can run the same Docker build and what it will does since you're just changing the base R version, it will cache uh, the what you build before the Ubuntu and the compiler, uh, the pre like prerequisite for the R, and you do not need to rebuild it again. The re Docker has a, a smart mechanism that uh, it's remember all those layers, and if nothing change, it will just cache it and use it. And this is what's nice about Docker. So those two layers, because we didn't change anything, we cache them. Now we're adding a the third layer, which is a new. So uh, it's a different version. So it's going to reinstall uh, from scratch. Because of the layer that the way the Docker built, once we change one of the layer, any layer that will come after, we'll have to reinstall from scratch. So this is something to take into account the way that we are designing a Docker. We need to think um, about if there are components that we're going to keep modify and there is no meaning for the order, let's keep them on the end. Because otherwise, whenever you are changing uh, those components, it will rerun and build the rest. And you won't see today because I pre-rendered the dockers. And so it won't do the run. But like when you're deploying Docker from scratch, the first build might may take some Time. So it could be like to build some Docker like this could be like 15 minutes of reinstalling all those components. And inside Docker, there are two approaches. There is the freestyle approach and there is the building uh, our Docker approach, which is mainly the worker. The freestyle is meaning that you're building from scratch. You're really going and speaking with the machine and tell the machine like what two components do you want to have from really like installing the compiler uh, on Ubuntu and uh, then install all the other components. The pros of this approach that you get high customization, it's better uh, uh, optimization of the Docker size and performance and it's learning experience. So if you, I really recommend that if you are once you get to understand like how Docker work, try to build your first Docker from scratch. Um, the cons of it is require some advanced knowledge of how uh, bash scripting and uh, command line is working, and it's require more testing. The other approach, which is much more robust in my mind, is to use out of the box images that the community is building, and the main uh, uh, app for Docker for R is Rocker. And the pros of it, of course, that someone already built it and you know many people are using it, so it's robust, it's a minimal effort. Um, there's low barriers to entry, so if you just started uh, with working with Docker, just import those um, kind of like you are import a Linux box that have everything already inside, and then you can add some customizations. So it might, might not have all the packages, but once they are installed, it's straightforward to go and install the rest. Um, the cons is, is, of course, that you have limited uh, versions, that, so you need to build a top fit, and there is less optimization option. So in the uh, demo, we will see like the difference between starting from scratch and building a Docker with a, a built-in built uh, image. 
So before we jump to the demo, this is like last um, uh, theory. So in order to build a Docker uh, file, you need a doc to, in, sorry, in order to build a Docker image, you need a Docker file. And a Docker file is it's a list, is simply as a list of instruction about what you want to have in the Docker. So you're using a different command. So for example, a Docker will always start with from, you need to pull some image. Um, so typically you can start like the minimum is like the OS, OS image, or if you have already like a Rocker image ready with all the components, you can go and like, let's say I want to pull R version four with Tidyverse installed and you have this uh, built-in Docker that you're pulling it. Uh, there are other comments like the label um, run. So whenever you want to run something on the command line and anything is done with the run, so use it. If you want to copy from your local folder to the Docker, so use the copy and you have the env and the CMD that we will talk later in the example. So I won't um, go over it now. And then there are some command lines. So assuming that some of you may not familiar. So I just go over it really quickly. Uh, you, we shouldn't really worry about it. So uh, since you're using a, um, we use today uh, Ubuntu. So sudo is the main uh, command to install uh, stuff inside uh, Ubuntu from the command line. So it just stands for super user do. It's equivalent if you are working with Python to the pip. If you want to install packages in, in Python, you do pip install and then a package. So it's work the same way. We have the wget. So if you want to install something from the web, you have a, some link and you want to pull some image. Let's say you want to download the R uh, version, R Studio version from the R Studio repository. So you just need to use the web get. Uh, crawl work the same as web get. Uh, if you want to run R script on the command line, so use the R script command and then like specify the command. And bash is a Unix shell command language, which is helping us to, if you want to run multiple uh, R script, it's sometimes easy to use a bash script that you automate the process if it's running on the command line. So with that, I think we can move to the demo. I will pause and see if there are any questions. So I just open, I guess I need to open the um yeah, so let's start. Um I hope I didn't miss anything. So optimization of a Docker. So Docker, as we will see it in a second, I think it will be much more clear after we see the example, it's built in layers. If you are creating multiple layers, the size of the Docker will be bigger. If you are, um, you, you can run all in one layer. Let's say that you need to install multiple package. One way to install it, like to build one layer for data packages like dplyr, uh, tidyr, and so on. Another layer for building uh, visualization packages like ggplot, plotly. And third layer to build uh, I don't know, like uh, modeling stats packages. And this is will be, will have a bigger size as opposed if you are just creating one layer because Docker has a smart mechanism that save each layer. So if you're going to call the same layer from a different implementation, it will remember that this layer is exists and will cache it. So this is something to take into account. And we will see an example, so don't worry about it for now if it doesn't make sense. And yes, so, and this is what's great about the R Docker. So the question is for a built-in Docker, can we make uh, some upgrades? So for some layers, and yes, you can add additional layers. You cannot change the existing layers, in, but you can add additional layers. So if you're pulling, let's see, example,
So I'm sharing all those links at the end of the presentation, and I will add it to um, to the repo. But Docker R is is uh, this is Docker App, so I didn't talk about what is Docker App. Docker App is essentially like GitHub. All the images are stored in in, in, Got, in Docker App. There are maybe other solutions, but this is the main one. And under Docker App, you can go to Rocker, and there are many images. So you see that. Uh, you have image for Tidyverse, for uh, R Studio, uh, for a different version of R. So if you go to the R ver, you're going to see that you have a different flavor of R. So I want to try to find. Oh, so yeah. So you need to go to the tags. Here you see you have version 4 with Ubuntu, here you have version 4.1, and version 4 with CUDA, which is another flavor of uh, Linux. And so you have like many versions, and I think like you have the old one, the 3.63. Uh, so it's essentially you can probably find any version of R inside the Docker container. I hope I, I answered the question. I'm going to, okay, so given we fix the environment, can we create a file route available to upgrade where several apps can be added and they run through that environment without rebuild? Yes. So essentially, if I'm understanding the question, let's say that you are uh, using a, uh, some Docker version 3.62 to multiple uh, Docker images. So once you build it for the first time, whenever you use it for another implementation, it will actually go and cache it from your previous uh, usage. Uh, yeah, the con so the question here is about the container R. I think I saw it in the past, I, I didn't use it, but I think the idea is that you can automate shell command to create dockers, but uh, I never use it, so I, I don't want to mislead anyone. But definitely there are people that are developing tools inside R to uh, build Dockers in a much more smooth uh, manner. So let's just jump to the demo. I will use my, so I will use two, two screens. So first, this is my R environment. Um, maybe I should increase the font. And this is the terminal. Um, so when you work with Docker, you usually use both. Um, any commands that you need to run to call Docker is typically you can you can done either from the terminal or from the um, Docker dashboard. I will use here the terminal, and then I will, will show the equivalent from the Docker uh, dashboard. Uh, Rami, sorry. Uh, the terminal, uh, can you make it bigger? Yeah, definitely. Let me see. So I have a white screen. So is this size? Can you see it? Three. Now it's better? Yes. And then maybe I should have also here. And and anything that's available on uh, this. Um, so this is the repository that I shared on, on uh, my GitHub. Uh, so anything that's available here, you can also go and see directly on the um, repository in, in GitHub. It's sync, sync with the most recent one. So like, let's start, so I have here like um, 10 different uh, examples. Let's start with really the basic, it's like a low world of the uh, Docker. So what we're going to do now, we will copy it to the terminal and then explain exactly what each component of the, uh, of the component of the, this command. So uh, Docker is, is kind of like the, 
command that we are using, and Docker has a many arguments. So the argument that we are using now, the second argument is run, which essentially, when you want to, you have a Docker image and you want to run it, you call it with a run argument. And Docker um, forward slash uh, wellsy uh, is the image name. So we're going to call it, and it just saying that it's in Docker repository. Under Docker repository, this is the name of the image, we'll see. And then you have a command, which is cow say, and this is the, um, but we wanted the cow will say. So essentially now we're going to run it. So we see that unable to find image. So it's just saying that cannot find it on the local machine. So it's going to pull it from the Docker hub. And this image has those layers. So each each line here, it's representing a layer. And since I already rerun it before, so it already exists, so it's cache it. So it's avoiding rerun it again. And then it's running some code, which just give you this uh, well, let's say, hello world. And this is what we put as the input. Um, so the idea is that uh, what we did now here, we pull a Docker from Docker Hub with the argument and we execute it. So this is just a simple uh, Docker uh, for showing the, what you can do with Docker, but it's uh, just a silly example. Let's start with building uh, Docker. We want to build a Docker version 4. So in order to build a Docker, we need to have the Docker file, which is a list of commands. Maybe I wish should do it like this, it's full screen. Um, and you're just telling the computer what you want to install. So instead of, for, for example, if you're having a Linux box and you want to install something, you can go to the terminal and, and uh, do it. Um, you can do it, you know, like doing everything in the terminal line by line. And I guess it's different between the, the console and the script in R. So instead of doing it line by line, you are just saying it in one script just go over those commands. So this is what Docker file does. Uh, and and the, this is like you, you comment uh, in Docker file the same way that you comment in a, in a normal R uh, script. I just put here like the list of, you know, like the main commands that we are using and we go over all of those now. So always you start with from, you need to, start with some OS. So it could be a Docker that uh, it give you the OS from scratch, or you could have some other Docker, like something from a Rocker that already some create a Docker with OS and build on top of it. But you need to start with the from. So once we pull this image of uh, Ubuntu, which is a OS that's running on Linux, we can add label and it's optional. And level just saying that if someone want to check who build the, some information, you can leave information about the Docker. So you're just saying, this is my name, is my, I'm the maintaining this uh, Docker and I specify it under the label. The env um, argument enable you to set argument, a variable. So here I'm defining uh, the version of the R, I'm defining four, a three, variables is the major. So our version has uh, three components, is the major, the minor, and the patch. So like version 4.0.0, 0, 0, the major will be 4, the minor going to be 0, and the patch going to uh, 0. So for example, if you want to change the R to be built to version 3.62, so you are just changing the environment over here, and then it will rerun everything and build it with the version that you wish. And this is an example. So like when, as I mentioned before, when it, you're starting from Ubuntu, it's a clean environment. You need to install from scratch uh, all the libraries that require to run R. So when you're buying like uh, Mac or Windows, most likely that your uh, Mac or Windows uh, devices would have all those library. When you're working with the Ubuntu or 
this type of Linux, usually they are coming really clean and you need to install it from scratch. So for now, just give it as a given that those are the libraries that are, uh, you need to install. I actually just copied from another Docker. Some of them are familiar, some of them are, I really don't know their functionality. There is actually a way to go on Debian and check it, but it, I, I, won't, I don't want to get you too uh, confused, but essentially you can see like that uh, this is fault and, and this is Git. Uh, G++, I assume it's related to C++ library. Uh, TZ data is for time zone. Sudo is to be able to run sudo command and install stuff. So essentially, uh, if you want to run our markdown, you will have to install Pandoc and so on. And here, this is, so this is, will go under a layer. So the layer, this is going to be running as a one layer all the way up till here, and we're going to cache it. So when you see, um, when you start to create the layers, this is going to be a single layer. And now we're starting a new layer. And here we are calling um, the R Studio to install the R version, and we're using the argument. So here the R version major going to be four. Uh, this is how you use argument in a command line with the dollar sign. Uh, so we're going to ask for version four zero zero, and we continue. So we, you anything that you need to have in the in order to run run, it's to run R will be over here. Um, so essentially once you go and try to run it, so you have the Docker file and you want to run it. So you will have to do the Docker build. Docker build is execute the, the R command that you need. So let's just log in to the repository and show how does it work. So now I'm going back to my terminal and I'm going to go to my library. So it's under R works. Workshop, our ladies, Tunis, and session one. So you see here I have uh, a Docker file in the readme, which is over here. And now I want to run the Docker file. So I need to run full Docker and use the build argument. I will use the dot, which is saying that use any file inside the root folder that you are, instead of specifying all the path. And then I want to call to use the tag. So I want to give a name for this image that I'm going to build. Uh, I'm using the T uh, dash T argument for tagging. And you can call it, let's say that you want to call it base R and we're going to tag the image and we're going to tag the image as 044. So base R is, we have two components. The first component is base R is the name of the image and you want to have also tag. And the reason that we're using tag is because we, you may build different versions. So it's kind of like helping you to uh, maintain different versions. So uh, here I'm calling it version 400. And if I'm going to install 02, so I'm going to call it 402 and so on. If you want to use the tag by default, you will call it, I will tag it by last, which means the last uh, version to use. Now, um, I will add another component. Um, so you need to think like in GitHub that you want to push it to a repository and I'm going to add to use my username in, in Docker app, which is our Crispin. And it just tag it as, as like this, the way, as, as the Docker name is R Crispin dash uh, and the name of the image that when I want to push it to the uh, Docker app, I won't need to re-tag it. So just for convenient reason. So since I already rerun it, so you see that step uh, are already there. So let's start from the beginning. So we have 18 steps or 18 uh, layers in this Docker. So you see the first one here and we can go and see it over here, starting with from. 
Uh, since I already run it, it's cached. It. It's as the address of this uh, layer and, and just cache it. If we were to build, we had to build it from scratch, it would probably take us half hour to run off it, all of it. So we see it's using the cache and so on. So any any layer. So this is the uh, label. It's another layer, and then the uh, and the environment definition. Each one is a layer, and it's keep caching all of it because we didn't change anything. And now we have the Docker ready. So. The next thing that you want to do is to um, maybe you want to push it uh, to the Docker repository. So you can just do Docker push and the name of the Docker. Since we already specify the um, Docker address, it will it will automatically will. Uh, push it to uh, the Docker Hub. And since there were no any, there, I didn't change anything in the Docker layer. So it's it that nothing changed. So it's just uh, doing nothing. And you can go now to the Docker Hub and see if I have it here. So essentially, you see that we just uh, we published it a minute ago, uh, and um, you can see the, histo the the history of the Docker, and you can uh, we tag it. Let's go to the tagging, and you can see we tag it as as uh, four zero zero, and you can get some information, and you get the size. So it's one gigabyte. Uh, all this Docker um, and the environment. Now, if you want to, anyone can go and pull it. So if you're doing Docker uh, pull and the name of the Docker, you can actually use it to create your own Docker and you don't need to build our version four if you're interested in our version four. So the other component that you want to maybe to access the Docker and see the environment. So uh, is use it as a virtual environment so you can you can go and do docker run and the run is the argument to run the docker um, we specify t and d so t is enable us to open it in a terminal and d is to um, print the, on the background the details so you see this is the container so I didn't, I didn't mention before, but there is in Docker, the, there is container and there is image. Image is what we created before. Once you run it, it's containerized it and it's now living in a container. So now we can go and access the Docker on the container and just make sure that we can see what's going on inside of the Docker. And it makes sense maybe after a few examples, but Essentially, to access the Docker, um, for that, I guess I need to get the container name. So let's do con container yes, and it's give me the container the, the list of containers that's running. Uh, let's see. So let's access uh, this one. So Docker container PS uh, give you the information of all the containers that you have running at the at, at the moment, and I will take the name of the container. And you see, this is the beginning of the same beginning of the this is the full name, and I'm just using the beginning. Um, I will copy it, and then I'm doing going to do Docker execute uh, IT, so it's in terminal, the container ID, and we want to have it in, open it in bash, in shell. 
So now you see I, I'm in new environment uh, and you can see that I can call out. When I'm calling out now, I open the R on the Docker container and it's the version four. Um, let's get out of there. So we, what, essentially what we did, we built a new environment and we installed, uh, and you can go inside the Docker and you know you can do, uh, get the list of um, files that are available on the Docker, on the Docker image. And it's, it's a virtual environment essentially. I will pause here and see if there are any questions. Uh, yes, Rami. So, uh, there are questions uh, from Ali. So he said uh, one more question. Uh, so I think, yeah. Um, one more question. I saw some R package called container. It can it uh, automate shell commands creation. And the, also he said you spoke you spoke about setting up uh, the OS. And we know uh, Docker is running uh, mainly on Linux. But what if we were supposed to work on Windows, such is uh, the case for most co companies? How can we say that? Yeah, so um, essentially, I, I, I'm, I'm working on Mac, and Mac is equivalent in that, that sense to Windows. So I'm running it at Docker uh, um, a, on Mac, and in order to run it on, on Mac, I need to have the Docker engine, which is this this part if i i walk i used if i used i had a linux box i didn't have to use the docker uh desktop because you can run it natively but the docker desktop can create the environment that enable you to run it uh as linux essentially it's created a virtual linux that enable you to run docker within um mac and it's worked the same in same manner in Windows. So you can use it in Windows. Uh, and the idea that you're usually like the use case is when you are you are using uh, some OS like Windows or Mac, but your deployment is running in some Linux box or some server or you're deploying to AWS and those usually using some kind of Linux. I hope I answer this question. Any, I see a question which I'm not sure about the username. Um, yeah, so why there are three containers? Are, yeah, so I see like a question, I guess, let's go outside from the Docker. So let me do exit. I'm going, I went back to my uh, terminal. So let's do Docker container, list of the containers. And someone asked why I have three um, different containers. And the reason that I already, before we started the, uh, the workshop, I tested and I run it and I build it. So each time that I build it, they're still running. So Docker PS give you what is currently running. And if you want to stop it, you can do Docker um kill it's a bit uh, tough <laughs> really are the I'm not sure why they use this word but and the container name and now you can go and see you see i have only two uh and then like similarly they can you can you know like keep deleting so... the next one Um, so uh, I think we have another question from Ali. He said, "Can you please give us hints about Docker, Dockerizing an app built with Python and R at the same time while Python is pulled from a specific uh, environment such as uh, Miniconda?" Um, so I, I I don't think I ever use 
Python, but essentially it's work the same. So like if you're going back to the Docker file that we installed here, uh, you can just run. So assuming that you install all the requirement for Python, you can do like here I'm installing R and you can do another run and you know, like uh, do installation of Python. And if you want to use a, a, a different environment and I think it's like, a, like a Miniconda. So I'm sure that if you will go and Google, or maybe you do over here, mini. you're going to have a Docker already with Miniconda. Uh, and there are many. So, um, and one, one way to learn how to build Docker, and I will go to it in a second, but I will, we're already here, so let's just go over it. So if you're talking about Miniconda, and you want to understand how the installation, is working, you can go to the Docker file. And see the process. So you see it works the same way that I installed the R with the wget. And you're pulling it from Miniconda and you specify some version and all the requirement. And that's it. It's really straightforward. So you're starting you here. Uh, they're using Debian and then they're defining some environment variables and they're installing a uh, requirement. So I guess those are the requirement that needed to run Miniconda. And that's it. It is, it's really, I think it's very intimidating if you didn't work on the but it's really straightforward once you understand the concept of how does it work. I hope I, I answer. Okay, cool. So let's go to the next example. So this is, this is like just basic example. Like I just want to give you a sense of how you are building, uh, our environment. Uh, but essentially, um, you don't need to do it from scratch. You can, uh, use different Docker that already like the rocker that already have the, all those components and then continue from that point and add more layers. So you see like the, the first Docker, it's uh, almost 100 lines and it's a lot of stuff that I myself, I need to go over it. I'm not sure that I understand all the commands here. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure that like someone that never used the command lines might be intimidating, but like let's simplify it. So assuming that you already create, you have an image of R and it's like you have many beside the Docker, there are other people that creating their own image and you can go and pull the R version. So let's start now when we want to install Tidyverse. So here we're going to pull the Docker that I already created. And as you see, it's, it's much more clean, cleaner um, installation. You have only three lines of codes. So you start with the, the Docker that already has the prerequisite to install our packages. And um, we're pulling this, it's already coming on Ubuntu with our install. We have the label, it's optional, you don't necessarily need to have it. And then you're building the third layer, which is run. When you say run, you're just saying to go to this, the, to, uh, the, the command line and run this script. So if I go and do it on my command line, Essentially, I'm going to install on my R. I'm getting an error, and I will speak about this error in a second. But um, uh, essentially, that's how you build uh, install packages. So you're calling R. This is the way that you call R from the terminal. And you want to execute something. So you do the dash E. And this is the command. So this is like when you put it in, in double quotes. Essentially, you are in R. And this is the familiar, like how we install packages, so install package and the name of the package. So it could be any package that you want. Uh, so let's, let's, let's go to the second example and, and run it and see what's going to happen. And then just give you an answer, it's going to fail. Oh, it's still two. Oops. So we have here again the Docker file. So let's. Um, I just copied the build to save the time. 
So um, maybe I will make it a bit bigger here that we can see the full. So again, we are doing build. Uh, we want to tag it, and I'm going now to tag it as last because we're installing the most recent version of Tidyverse. Um, and let's see what's going to happen. So it starts with the, the first um, layer that already exists, so it's caching it from, we already built this Docker. This is also a, it's used from another, from the previous Docker probably that already used it, so it's cached. It. And now it's it's getting, it's, it's running uh, this command and it's running on the uh, terminal and you get this error. And you see that uh, trying to use CRAN without setting mirror. And and the reason I put it, and, and I want to show you like why we're getting this error. And, and this is like a typical Docker error that you will face uh, that essentially you're starting from scratch. And when you're used to work on your R, there is the R environment uh, file that's setting all the mirrors. Like, so for example, if I can do get options reports, see that it already set uh, the mirror to use. So if I go to install packages, you can see that it will pull this option. And since we didn't set all, uh, when you're installing R from scratch, you don't, you don't set those environment variables, so it will fail, so we need to think about it. So let's repeat it now, but let's go and get this variable. Let's go to example three. Close all of those. And for me, it's going to be much more simpler the, and more intuitive to understand how Docker works because really simplify uh, the code. So again, um, what I add, I just define the repo. A more advanced method is that you can actually set your R environment file and, and copy it to the uh, 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 the install our version setting. So you can pre-customize uh, your favorite setting. So for example, uh, your mirror and other uh, variables are already set in your machine and make sure that you're working in the same environment. So if we're gonna give an example like what you probably can do, if you go to global options, and you have code, I, I'm using snippets. It's like really wonderful tools to save time. So I have those shortcuts that enable me to uh, run shortcuts. So for example, um, one of my favorite is like uh, DG, which is creating deep layer group by and summarize. I can show you how does it work. So if I will go now and do, oops, not this one, and shift tab, it will create a uh, dev tool document. So if I do DG, it will create uh, the shortcut, it's easy to, and those are pre-setting. So you can actually create those, copy those settings. It's sitting in some text file and you can uh, add it to your Docker. And when you're working on, on the R Studio environment, you can have the same setting. Let's just go back to Docker. And now let's try to run again the Docker with the Tidyverse and install. So now we, uh, because I already ran it before to save the time, it's pre cache it. And uh, we have the it's install it. Now we want to make sure that you have uh, installed and everything is working. So let's do again 
uh, docker, let's get the container name, so docker container ps, and we have, oh, we need first to run it, so let's do docker run, and it is tidyverse, and let's get the container, so you see now I have two containers. Um, I will take the ID and let's log to the terminal to SSH the container essentially. Now we are inside the Docker and let's call R. So we have the same version, right? We have version R. And so I'm just Cannot see my screen. Docker, uh, Docker uh, package version ID, and we have installed. All right, um, and this is kind of like leading me to the next topic: is the version of the packages. So sometimes the problem that you are creating, the scenario is that you're creating some Docker and it's all working. You're pushing it to production and everything is working. And at a certain point you want to add an additional component. Let's say after three months that your Docker is running smoothly, you want to add, you're implementing a new functionality and you need to add new package. So you're going and rebuild it. If you are going to run the same way that I ran before the Docker, you may face a new problem that once you rebuild the Docker uh, and the package you install as new version, it will reinstall new version of the packages, which is not necessarily what you tested on your testing environment and what it will cause that it might cause you some problem that your code might not run properly. So essentially, um, you want to make sure that you're keeping the same environment uh, on your development, the same package version. This is my recommendation when you are setting a doc profile, make sure that no matter what you're running it after you test it and you get to this, that some uh, versioning, that you set this versioning and, and lock it down. So one way to do it is to install from, make sure that you are checked that you go and do the same thing and you make sure when you're installing that the package didn't change and if the package changed, so you're going to install from the archive version. This is more convoluted. A more simplified way to do it is use the uh, M run. M run is a Microsoft um, snapshot of, of CRAN. And what they're doing there every day, they're taking a snapshot of CRAN. So you can set a snapshot of CRAN for a specific day. Um, and you will always use the same snapshot and you will always be able to uh, install only the, the what was available up to that date on CRAN. So in this example, previous example, we installed Tidyverse version uh, 130. Now, if we go and see tidyverse packages, this is the most recent one, uh, and it was released on November 21st, uh, 2019. Let's assume that you want the previous version, uh, which I think it was uh, 1.2. 1.21. Um, so essentially, you need to set the M run mirror to be uh, after November 17 and before November 19. Um, so let's go and see how we are going to do it. So, so using the M run, you're using.
So essentially, you're changing the repo from what we used before, which was uh, the normal Crane R Studio mirror to MRun. And the last part of MRun is the snapshot date. So here we are setting uh, the repo, the snapshot to November 1st to ensure that we install uh, the version that we want. And essentially, if you are going to install any package using this uh, um, repo, it will only install if it was available at that time. So we need to make sure that if it's a new package and you set it before it was released, you won't be able to install it. But let's, let's now test this uh, build. Let's go back to the terminal. So, quit our sit at right. So now we are on the fourth example. Let's do docker run and let's call it target as m run. We're going now to run this essentially this docker file with a snapshot of November 11. Now, since I already uh, run it again, so it's really fast. Oh, sorry, it's running, so I need to build it actually to do it like this. And again, you see um, it's caching the layers. Oh, here, I know why it didn't cache. So now you see how it's installed and you see how it's downloaded all the requirements for Tidyverse. It might take some time, so let me just to avoid the, and this is what taking, like in, in the first time that you're running a Docker, it might take some time. Uh, so let's open a new terminal over here while this is, is running and Okay, so let's see what Docker. So I already ran it before. So let's do Docker container PS. And we want to run and access this Docker, the M run. So let's do Docker execute and oh, I think it won't. Oh, I missed the digits. Okay, so now we are inside. And let's check the packet, check the packet version. And now we see we have version 1.1. So essentially, this is something you need to think when you are working in a Docker environment. Um, that you want to at least keep installing the that version. I will pause here and, and see if there are any other questions. Can Rami? someone yeah. was, sorry, can you show the terminal because it was really small? I couldn't, yeah, see it. Oh, actually. yeah. The I other think. one, yeah, this one. Can you make it yeah. bigger? Yeah, sorry. So you see here, essentially, this is the version that is now running on uh, the M run tidyverse, as opposed to version 1.3. So we essentially lock down uh, the date of the CRAN uh, packages snapshot and this is how we can ensure that we, uh, whenever we run the Docker and refresh it, it will still install the same packages. Now, if you have a different version, like let's say that you want from a different snapshot, so you can do different layers. And for example, for a 
uh, a specific packet, you can use a specific date, and for other packets, you want more advanced version, so you can separate it and use a different snapshot. But uh, it's easy to manipulate and, and use it. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Um, can it, I will just go over the, some of the other questions over here. So can, can it com show how to combine with our So I, I don't have an example with our environment. Maybe I can find like some example in a second in, in, a, uh, in the Docker R, but if not, I can definitely can create a, a code example or how you set your R environment. I think it's important. Yeah, it's a good question. And it's important uh, things to do to be able to set environment. So definitely I will, I will add it to the additional um, part for the workshop. Can you recommend uh, a link as a resource to manage uh, different outputs from different Dockerized app for Nginx? Nginx. So I'm not familiar. I, I heard about what is Nginx. I probably not pronounce it correctly. Uh, but uh, this is beyond my knowledge, like uh, my usage. I know that people are using it, but I'm, I'm, I don't have knowledge about how to uh, use it. I have a link at the end for a resource from Free uh, Code Academy that actually talking about how to use uh, different Dockerized apps through NGIX. I know about this concept, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that I feel comfortable to explain how it's work and it's also a thing that it might be confusing for people to just start with it. But I definitely will share the link. All right, so I think we are ready for the next um, example. Can we pull out the current requirement out of our text instead of searching in CRAN? You mean, so the question is, can we pull all current requirement from your current environment in R in a text file? Yes. So essentially, let me, let, yeah, so you can actually, you can write a script. So if you want to set the same version that you're running on your local, uh, I'm, I have, um, I have letter an example that you can actually go and check the install versions. Um, but essentially, you can write a script that uh, go and pull the version that you're using. And based on this, it installs it. But you need to map it to the date if you're using MRAN. Another way is to install directly from the archive, uh, which is kind of like you're setting uh, the exact environment, like the exact version that you want when you're setting it to the uh, archive. The, the, the only disadvantage of installing from the archive is that when you're installing directly from the archive, and I will show the what when I say the archive. So if you go here for the tidyverse archive, and you let's say you want to install directly this file. So essentially, I think the way to do it is to copy this link and then do all packages and we want tidy else and then we said the we I think it's the reports or the source I'm not sure but let's see if it will work yeah I think it's working so uh, essentially the downside of um this that no it's not so i think it's the source but the, if you are using this approach by so, like installing from the archive that it doesn't go through the dependency list and it means that it it's not going to install the dependency in in, in a package like tidyverse there are stones on of dependency and then you will have to go and install it one by one which is really a manual effort 
so unless you are having like writing a script that go and understand what are the discrepancy or the missing uh, dependency and install it from scratch, you it will be very convoluted. So I'm I'm not really recommended to do it like this. It was a long answer for a short question, but I hope I answered the question. All right, let's keep going. So um, we talked about Walker. Let's see how Walker is working. So essentially, it's work the same. So in this case, I'm running the previous example of installing um, R. Installing tidyverse, uh, I'm going to use the current um, mirror, but I'm starting, I'm using the Walker. I'm using Walker, and here is the version of our base is 4.0.3. And essentially, it will run the same. So I won't spend time now to run it because we already did, but the, and the result is going to be exactly the same. But essentially, what I'm like, this is how you use customized Docker. And, and, and Walker has so many Dockers that I recommend that if you never build Docker, start with this approach. And you see, like, it's just a few lines of code as opposed to build it from scratch. Once you understand the concept, start to dive, you can go into Rocker, see the Docker files of how they build their images and, and try to understand what's uh, the process of doing it step by step. The next example, so we saw like when we want to install one package, uh, and then like if you want to add more packages, essentially we need to put it under C, and we can specify, um, let's say, focus package and so on, and add additional packages. But it might be, um, uh, too convoluted. So another way, it's more robust way to do it, is to, to go and use the install to our uh, command, which is um, go over the documentation. So the the same group that create the Docker R, they're also developing tools to install tools to use to install R packages and anything related to R inside the Docker container. And I'm sorry, my internet is super slow. And essentially this is, so uh, Derek, uh, Derek uh, Edil Butter, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing correctly, is kind of like the main contributor, is the guy that wrote the R CPP package, which is used, it's probably the package that's used uh, the most in R. He also developing is supporting and developing the uh, Docker R. Um, and essentially, if you want to install, this is equivalent to install uh, our package, but from the terminal as opposed to from calling our script. So before we had to call our script, open R, and then run some command in R. Here you can do it directly with the install uh, to .r. Uh, function from the terminal. Now, there are different arguments. I only use the error, which saying that if it's failed to install, it will trigger an error and kill the, the build. Uh, and then I'm using the backslash to, instead of having all in one line, it's kind of like spacing it, but essentially this is the functionality. And you see here, I am installing in multiple layers. So the first layer is the data packages like Lubridate, uh, Deeplier, Pool, Data Table. The second layer is modeling. Uh, this is, a, in this case, a time series. And the third layer is visualization tools. And you can do it in one layer. The only thing that you need to think that if you change, let's say, now you change the feeble and you build it in one layer, you have to reinstall all of those from scratch. But once you separate it uh, and you install first this, and then you're doing change over here, anything that was created before 
does not necessarily need to rebuild from, again, it will cache it. Uh, so this is another way to build it. Um, the only thing that you might face, and this is kind of like a error handling, is when you are start to expand and install multiple packages, you may have some dependency that either did not install on your best our Docker, uh, or may you try to install and fail. So you need to start to debug it. So just be minded that, always be minded that you're starting from scratch. It's not necessarily like, it's easy to, on your machine, either if it's a Mac or Windows, uh, in most of the cases, they're already coming with all the dependencies, so you don't need to do anything. When you install R, it's there. In, in Linux box, it's different. It's really empty box, and we are just populating it. The Docker R, or uh, should have most of the components, but sometimes there are, like if you have unique packages, you may need to find what is missing and then go and uh, install it from EDOS for the Docker. Okay, this is fun example. So, Once you build your Docker and you want to test it in our studio, so essentially um, you can also add to the Docker and install our studio and run it on your local browser. And here in this folder, you have the dependency list, um, all the uh, requirement that you need to install um, our studio. And you have, the, you, you have like a SH is standing for uh, shell script or bash script, which help you to automate. But um, for your, if you're running and copy it as it is, you just need to run the Docker file and we call all those files. And this is why we're using the dot argument when we want to run additional files beside the Docker file when you're doing the build. And if you're building a testing environment or working environment, you have a it's better to create like a Docker with all the packages that you want to run and call it starting from there when you're doing the from command and then install RStudio as opposed to also add to this Docker and install over here the, the package. It's much more easy to manage it when it's separate. Um, so this is, I think if you want, you can just copy as it is this Docker file and just change your, your uh, pre-image Docker with all the requirement and you get our, our environment, our studio with your environment. So let's see how does it work. So we will start with building the, the Docker as before. So we'll exit with our studio. Let's go to 07. Again, we will build, build the Docker. Make the size a bit from here. And this time we're going to tag it as our studio and the name of the packages that we are using. So we are using here the tidyverse image. So just it's just convenient at putting it as a tagging tidyverse. Uh, and we're going to run it. So I already we uh, ran it before, so it's caching, it's faster. And now we use this to call it. And here it's, it's where it's become much more fun. Let's go back to the Docker file. So sometimes you want to expose what you build on your Docker. So when you're building like your Docker as a shiny app, you want to expose it to some port. So then you can run it on the browser. So at the end, you see the expose uh, command that's just saying, expose this Docker to port 8787. It's a random number. Uh, you can use different number 
assuming that this port is available. And essentially, um, what we're going to do now is to map this um, port that's available on a Docker to uh, a port on, on my local machine and to run it. So let me just, maybe I will. Okay, so we're doing again docker run. Um, RM is just saying that uh, keep it, uh, so it's locked down my terminal because it's running. You can actually do a separate setting that it will uh, keep letting you use the terminal. It's like when you're running a shiny app, it's locked down your console. You cannot run it, so it's the same. And dash P is to mapping the port. So we expose on the Docker um, to 8787. And I'm going to map it to my local machine to the same port to 8787. And now I'm using those arguments. So our studio required to define password and user. There is, uh, I think the default is our studio and our studio. Um, I just changed it to password one, two, three, four, and user to Rami. And I'm calling, and this is the Docker that I'm, the image that I'm calling. So now if you go to my browser and do local post 8787, and I will use the credentials that I just set. I'm inside R that's running inside Docker. So again, we use version four. Um, we can see that the packages is um, of we installed tidyverse. So let's see, tidyverse is one point three. So essentially, this is how you you set your environment is and and. Once you create your Docker with your packages and you're running the code over here, and if you don't get any error, it's mean that your Docker is ready, and this is the point that you can shift it. Why don't we pause for a second and see if there is any questions? Okay, so we got two more examples. Just bear with me. I think they're fun. Um, so going back to the installation of R that we did in the first example that we installed R from scratch, let's say that you want to use argument and make it much more flexible. So that you want to run a script that the user can define some argument. And according to this, you set the Docker. So think about it like you can, if in, in the example that I'm going to show, it's like I'm going to make the version of R as argument, but like if you're installing specific packages, you can set the packages um, version and so on. So it's really like up to what you're trying to achieve. So I took the, the, the Docker file that we ran before to build the R version four. And you see it's starting again from with pulling Ubuntu. And I add this um, argument, arg argument, which are defining three variables. So the first one is the major, second one is the minor, and the third one is the patch. So those are equivalent to the version of R. And for the environment variable that were set before in the previous R, I defined um, the argument with a default. So if the argument, if the user don't provide uh, any, any value for those variables, it's going to use the default, which is 400. So. Rami? 
Uh, yes. Actually, I have a question about Ubuntu. Can we use yeah. Ubuntu 20, the la latest version of Ubuntu? I'm almost sure that you can. I. Yeah, let me find. So I create a link. I didn't. Sh so here you can go and see all all the versions that are available. All the OS. So those are like really the scratch, like the flavors of Linux that you can start if you want really to start from scratch. So you have your Ubuntu and then you can go um, and see the tagging. As far as I, I remember, there is the most recent one. So if you go to tags, so my tagging that I'm using is 18. So all of those tags, I guess there are different flavors. Trying to find, here. yes, we have 2010 and 2004, and this is what I'm using, 1804. So if you have a, a, a preference for the version of the OS, definitely you should have it here. And people are, you know, people are doing it like they have automation that every version should be available. And besides the Ubuntu, you know, some people prefer different flavors of Linux, so we can thank you and see. You're welcome. So we have it, uh, Alpine, which is another flavor, um, Debian, which is probably the main one for R. If you are working in Amazon, so this is Amazon Linux and Bash, technically Fedora. Uh, you have your essentially like all the flavors that probably exist. Okay, so once we set the argument, um, we can one we, we can build the Docker and use the argument to define the version. So let's first. How do I kill it? Um, I open a new terminal. Font. Let's go back to okay. So again, the build is starting with the build. Now, the only difference that we are adding the build argument argument, and then we're defining the arguments that we defined. So here, for each argument, you need to add the build argument and specify the argument and the value. So here's the major I defined as three, minor I defined as six, and the patch is two. So essentially, I'm, I'm, I'm installing version 3.6.2. Now, if I will run it, um, it's already cached what I ran it for, and we can do docker on and base our b three six two. Let's get a container name. So this is what we want. And we have version 3.6.2. And essentially, you can think like you can use your margin to use whatever argument that you want to make. Like any any functionality you want to be dynamic, you, use, you should use the argument. It's really cool functionality. Actually, we have a question. So can yeah. Rocker be easily used on HPC once installed? 
especially without root permissions. I'm not familiar with what is HPC. Could uh, high performance Sophia, could you clarify? High performance. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, so I, I, I guess it depends on the admin. Uh, like what is the admin definition? I assuming that it's running on some kind of linear. So Rocker is just the image. So if you, uh, the question is like, what is the Docker engine? So the does the Docker engine has permission to write on APC or no? This is and this is something that uh, probably I'm not I'm not familiar and probably it's a question to the admin of the system because could be like some firewall that prevent it to run. But uh, there are ways because I'm I'm also working. So when you're working with enterprise version, so it's under a firewall and there is all the, you know, the security, that requirement. Um, so uh, it's a question to that mean, I guess. I don't see a reason it, it, it won't run unless it's really something really that's unique or doesn't support Docker. I, so I don't have a good answer for this. So let's read the R over here and okay. So I think we are getting close to the end. So here are some useful um, comments. So we already talked about a few of those. And I probably should add more, but the do Docker, um, I guess it's missing con NLPS, give you the container that's running. We already use it. Let's make it like this that we can. Uh, so Docker container give you the list of containers that are currently running and then you can do uh docker if you want to stop i, I showed that there is the kill command which is kind of like very hard command name uh, but you can do also stop i guess uh and the don't container id um and you can remove container with the rm Okay, now, so we stop the, this container from running. If you want to see the images that are available on your environment, so it's Docker images. Okay, so we, those are the ones that we created in, in the recent time. And you see like the one that I created before the workshop uh, already cast. So when we run it, we actually run this one like a couple of minutes ago, but it's show it's four hours ago because nothing changed and it used the, uh, the caching layer. Um, Docker logs. So Docker logs is, is, it's give you like, if you want to access for, if you have, are running container and you want to see what's going on in the container, you can use the here because I cannot see my but the bottom part of my screen. So let's say that you want to go and see what's going on over here on this container. So we can do Docker uh, logs. You see it's running. Um, this is the R Studio. So this is, and if you want to see like the R version that we ran before and still open, so you see it inside R. I'll like give you like, where is the point that it's, uh, last point that the Docker was running. Um, and 
last but not least, it's the Docker inspect. So let's say that you want to go and get the metadata of this uh, image. And you get a JSON file with a lot of information. Uh, some of it is probably you don't really care, but if you want to build automation and you want to get some information, for example, you can see like here you can see the environment variables that were defined. Um, the host name, the creation time. And I think there is also a way to see like the layers size. There's, I guess, more, most, more interesting. So those are the layers. Um, should be a way to see the, here is the size. And here is the OS. So sometimes it, it might be useful information uh, if you go and want to inspect what the system that the Docker is using or, or what is the thing is to use the inspect. Um, let's see, is there any questions? You're welcome. Some. I hope that we, I was able to inspire you to start using Docker. I'm, I'm sorry for all the interruption that we had uh, during the workshop, but I hope um, that um, you can, it's, it gives you like a good start if you never use it, give you a good start to go and use Docker and give you um, motivation to learn Docker. Uh, I will share, the last thing I want to share is some resources. Thank you, Remy, for this great workshop. You have You're been welcome. really presenting great work. So thank you all also for your attention, and I hope that uh, was uh, useful, and you got a uh, clear understanding about uh, Docker. So, Rami, you wanted to present some resources, or? Yeah, so here's like just the last point. Um, here are some, so the materials are going to be are already there in this repository. Um, and here is the documentation of Docker, uh, like all the comments, let's just call it. So if you want to, read, to go and read about Docker uh, and understand how it's work, you have your good documentation of the, like the, the logic benefit and you have also, um, should be somewhere like the documentation of all the comments. I should probably have it over here. This is the Docker app that we show like where we're storing the images. This is the worker. Uh, I recommend to go and see what Docker's they have, and essentially they have for the main thing. For if you're using Shiny, if you're using our Markdown or anything, they have read a pre uh, process Docker. And this is the good, uh, another good resource. I actually went and saw one of the videos just to refresh my knowledge in Docker, and I learned new new stuff. So uh, I I recommend if you want to go, uh, it's it's organized by the I guess like this is the video that I, I saw that give you really good information over like conceptually about Docker and I recommend to go over it. It's going more details about the command line. Um, so I recommend to use it. That's it, that's what I got. And I hope that uh, uh, I was able I... to convince you to start using Docker. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so yes, for for the one who wants to ask or are asking, yes, all the workshop materials will be sent to you later via email. Uh, thank you all for your attention and stay tuned to our upcoming events. And see you later. Goodbye. Bye thank bye. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Very much. Much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.